It's good, bro. Just got back from dinner. I saw, I saw, um, in the building. yeah, I saw your Instagram post. It was like date night. And I'm like, is, is Austin about to get, have a couple of Jack and Cokes for me? Oh, you already know. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Let, let's get right to it. So, all right, everybody, I'd like to welcome Austin Rutherford to the incubator. Austin is a real estate investor and coach, and he has over 500,000 followers on TikTok and 200,000 followers on Instagram. And he also knows a thing or two about crypto. How's it going, Austin? Good, brother. Looking forward to this, man. Yeah, this is so this is exciting because um, you're one of the first people that I actually know who I'll be interviewing. Like, um, so Austin and I met in Bitcoin Miami at the conference and we yep. were just like, wait a second, what's good? Facts, facts. Uh, not, not too many other Austins out there. <laughs> no, no. And at first I thought his, uh, you're, you're Austin with an EN and that, you know, if you were an EN, I don't know if we're doing this interview. <laughs> Thanks. That is funny. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, you're in real estate. So for everybody listening, um, can we rewind and can you talk to us and let us know, um, what your life was like before you bought your first property? Yeah. So my, like my original dream was to go to the NBA. Um, you know, I was, I was trying to be in the league, be in the playoffs happening right now, but as you can see, that didn't work out. <laughs> uh, so basketball like was my life at the time. Uh, I was 19 or when I fell out of love with the game of basketball and, uh, you know, I felt lost. I didn't really know what to do. I never came from a family that like with real money. Um, and I just kind of, I turned to books for whatever reason. Um, and I read a book called Think and Grow Rich, which opens up your mind to the possibility of making money. I started journaling every day. I fell into looking at multifamily apartment buildings. I was like, whoever owns that has to be making money, but mm -hmm. I'm going to do real estate. And, uh, I bought my first property when I was 20 years old, uh, back on Ohio State University's campus. Um, and then flipped my first house at 22 and made a hundred hundred and seven thousand dollars in that profit and uh, reinvested it all and then just blew the business up from there so you're 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 brushing over some details there i know i know i know this story a little bit more could you could you tell <laughs> us a little bit about how you're 19 years old it doesn't just you don't just read a book and then you make a hundred thousand dollars it's a little <laughs> bit harder than that can you tell us you know how you got from reading this book to you know getting to this a hundred thousand dollars how did you facilitate that first deal yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, I was journaling on a rooftop and I was like, there's a nine unit apartment building. I was like, if nine people are paying that one person, like it's got to work, you know, they got to be making money. So I started like buying like books and little, you know, webinars and whatever I could to learn real estate. Um, and at 20, I bought a dupe, I had $30,000 saved at the time from like flipping sneakers, flipping candy, stuff like that. And uh, had 30 grand, I paid for this rental property. I was making like $1,000 a month in passive income, uh, but I was dead broke again. You know, I put all my money into that. So I was like, all right, boom, I need to make more money to buy more rental properties. Um, so I got my real estate license. Um, I sold two houses, made like 15 grand, hated it. Um, I was on my way in to work as a valet and there's this ad that popped on the radio and it was like, you know, if you want to learn how to get rich and flip houses, you know, come to our free seminar. I uh, went to the free seminar, then they pitched a three day. I went to the three day, I paid like $300 for it. And then there they pitched a mentor program. And again, remember, I just put all my money into this thing. I had a couple grand to my name. And day two, they pitched the mentor program. They're like, you need 25 racks tomorrow <laughs> to join the mentor program. And I was like, oh, I'm fucked. But I felt like that was like that moment for me, like it was meant to be type of thing. Um, so I went home, called everybody I knew. Um, everyone's like, you know, it sounds too good to be true, blah, 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 Every, all, all the things you hear. Um, so I opened up a credit card, had a $15,000 line of credit that, that same day. Um, and it was like 2 a.m. and nobody would give me the money. And grown ass man, I was 20 years old, 20, I might've been 21 at the time. Um, and I crawled under my parents' dining room table and started crying because I felt like I was missing out on an opportunity of a lifetime. Um, parents heard me, came downstairs, saw I was dedicated, fronted me the other 10 grand, swiped the credit card. I uh, thought I was going to get rich overnight. Didn't really work like that. From the day I invested to the day I made money was 16 months. Uh, but finally it paid off, made $107,000 net profit. So you're, you see, you, you get your first property and then you see, okay, how do I get more money? And then you start learning and you, you take a risk. You, yep. you take a risk, you, you put that $300, <laughs> you put that 25 K for this class and you're taking risks. And now you're, yep. you have this 16 month period before you actually make money. What is going yep. on through your mind? Man, it was so I, the credit card had 18 months, no interest. If interest <laughs> kicked in, like, I was done, right? Like I couldn't afford it. 
So I was like, all right, well, I got to get this done in 18 months. Um, so for the first 10 months, I was valeting cars 50 to 60 hours a week. I was going to college full time, taking 15 credit hours. I was a licensed realtor showing houses and I was trying to start my real estate investment business. So like I was putting in a 16, 18, 20 hour day. So people always say like, you know, I don't have time. That's bullshit. Right. Uh, but I would, I would literally hand write letters to sellers from like 8 p.m. from when I got home to like midnight, 1, 2 a.m. every single day to get this house. So I did that for 10 months straight. I remember one time I literally fell asleep at the wheel because I was tired as shit. I woke up and I was on the sidewalk with the light pole in front of me. And I woke up and had to swerve back onto the road to not hit the light pole. So I was going. 10 months in, I bought my first house. I raised a quarter of a million dollars to fund that deal. I didn't use any of my own money. It was all other people's money. I mm -hmm. um, bought it, renovated it with other people's money, uh, listed it. I sold it in eight hours on the market. And uh, a week after my 22nd birthday, um, I cashed a check for $184,000. Uh, now, 60, 77 of that, I had to pay off debt. Um, so 107000 net was mine at the end of the day. So you're grinding, you're, you're balls to the wall, and you're like, you have this ticking time bomb, this 18-month debt, <laughs> and you're like, I got to get this done. And you touched on it. Um, you were grinding. And... A lot of people, they'll see, you know, where you're at today and, you, you know, you, you got a lucky break or whatever that is. Um, what are your thoughts to people who are who kind of say, you know, you got lucky? Uh, that's so I, I made a post yesterday on my Instagram. That was the picture that I posted. It was it was me and a Rolls Royce on the beach. And the comment that I made on it was uh, I remember when I remember when I had $100 in my bank account and hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. I remember when I was literally crying under my parents' dining room table because I was missing out on an opportunity and I felt like a failure. I remember when I was working 50 to 60 hours per week and going to college full time with no end in sight. I remember when my friends thought I was weird because I was working, but I wasn't making any money. So they didn't know what in the world I was doing. And they stopped calling me and stopped hanging out with me because they didn't know what I was doing. I remember all those dark times, but what I remember now is the success. So, you know, being, getting that luck of opportunity, be, you know, being handed something like that didn't happen. I've been in those dark times that a lot of people are in right now. And at the end of the day, like people that get it, find a way to get it. It's that simple. Um, so there's dark times, there's failure, there, there's doubt, there's self doubt, there's fear. There's still that same thing today. You know, I'm, I'm going into a new business venture right now. And I'm sitting here this morning, I was laying on my floor right here. And I was like, man, like, am I, do I really want to do this? I'm about to drop five grand to hire a mentor in the business. I'm like, yep, got to do it. Mm -hmm. So like we all have those times every, all the time, even the successful people, but it's something that we all go through. You just got to like force yourself past that at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you kind of created your own luck, you know, sure. you, you, the, the luck didn't smack you in the face. The, the luck took you to spend three hundred dollars where somebody normally wouldn't wouldn't do that like that yeah. luck wasn't luck of of course along the way you know you had to find a seller you had or you had to find a buyer you had to find a seller and you know maybe that was a single lucky event but the the mass quantity of effort you put in created the luck and it's not 100%. There's, there's a quote by Gary Vee, and I, I may butcher this a little bit, but luck, he's like, luck, I got real fucking lucky working till 3 a.m. in the morning, real fucking lucky working 100 hours a week, real fucking lucky. Da, 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 da. But like, if you swing enough times, like, you're not going to get lucky if you don't, if you don't get up to bat. But if you just up there fucking swinging, like, you're going to hit something eventually. Right, right. Uh, I'm yeah. like, I, my, yeah, that's my, my, like, with like content creation, with real estate, with whatever it is, it's like, I'll bet, you know, to, one out of, 50 if it if it comes down if i still get that hit you know what i'm like if you don't step up to the plate you're just not going to get a hit and you don't create luck by not acting and i think 100%. you're you're at least your your start right that start doesn't happen unless you put yourself in a position to really you know have this luck and almost manifest this success now 100%. you have this um your first deal it hits it really hits and Yep. You must have an aha moment. What happened right after that? What were you have? You make a hundred thousand dollars in profit. How did you, where yep. was the next step? Yeah. So again, 22 years old, uh, made, had a hundred thousand dollars in my pocket and, uh, I didn't, I didn't take a trip. I didn't buy a pair of sneakers. I didn't go out to a celebratory dinner. I didn't go out and pop bottles with my homies. Like I didn't do none of those things. I literally reinvested every single penny back into the business and went back to ballet 50 to 60 hours a week and went back to college taking 15 credit hours. 
and kept trying to do this real estate thing because one deal isn't going to change your life. A hundred grand, people get lucky and pop a hundred K and a month later they're broke again. So you got to understand like one deal is not going to change your life. So I went back doing exactly what I was doing because I wanted, I wanted more. I wanted the next thing. And I got my second deal flipped. It made about 40, 45, 50 grand on that deal. So I made $150,000 in about a 90 day period. Not bad. And, uh, that, that's like when it, when it went and I was like, I went home. So I promised my mother, I'd get my college degree. That's why I was going to college. So I went home that day. I was like, Hey ma, I ain't never getting my college degree. (laughs) (laughs) This is the college degree. (laughs) Yeah. And she saw, like, she knew what I was doing. And she's like, I wouldn't go back either. And then I walked into work that day and I was like, yo, boss. Like, I was real cool with my boss. And I was like, yeah, I ain't coming back. He's like, I figured this was coming. <laughs> and, uh, you know, again, reinvested it all into the business. This was like six and a half years ago, give or take. Um, since then, you know, I've flipped hundreds of deals, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of deals. Um, I built new construction. I own a few apartment buildings. I own a bunch of singles, a bunch of doubles. Um, you know, I lend money, I like anything in real estate, I've, I've got my hands into at some point in the business. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, so, we're still doing deals. Go ahead. Um, now you, and part of what, um, had, or at least how you started learning about this was taking this, um, mentorship program. Do you have any yep. tips or something that you really took out from that, that positioned you for this initial flip? Uh, so it's not just like one thing. So I always like people always ask like, how do you get started in real estate? There's two things, and I'm sure it's just like crypto. One is education. You need to like learn what you're doing, and two is implementation. Without either of those, you're screwed. Uh, but most people never get to the implementation phase. They just learn and keep learning and never take action. So for me, the the information that I had was information that I could have read in a book or I could have gone to YouTube to to learn. You know that inf- nothing's new in this world. It's somebody's already done whatever you want to do. So there's information out there. Um, you know, I just hired a mentor to get it all in one location and just bang through it. Um, so I learned it all of it in like two to three weeks and then I implemented the next day. So, you know, the, the thing, the takeaways was like how to market to people, how to come up with after repaired values, um, how to raise private money, how to manage contractors. Uh, and that was like, obviously I needed to know that to be able to flip houses. Uh, but it wasn't like just one thing. It was just education entirely. And then the key is the implementation at the end of the day. And they had like a coach, I think it was a coaching call like every two or three weeks or something. Um, so, you know, that, that helped, you know, obviously with the implementation mm-hmm. of things as well. So, like, yes, yeah, so you I, learned the I, skills and then you just had mm-hmm. to do it. You don't, the books are only so valuable. Eventually you got to yeah. put your, your ass on the line for lack of a better term. No, hundred percent. You know, people that take action, like are the ones that win people that sit on the, on the chair, on their ass all day, like they never want to do something anyway. And they always got excuses, time, money, uh, feelings, uh, partners, like there's always an excuse, you know, again, the people that get it, get it. Everybody else just continues to fail. So you just, you got to do it. You know, that's literally the difference maker is just putting in the work. There's a, there's a reason the, the Nike slogan, just do it is, you know, they're a nice. billion dollar company <laughs> for a reason. Like there's, there's truth to it. You know, you, the, the books teach you, you know, but you got to implement. And I like how you broke it down. It's the learning and it's the implementation. Everybody can yep. do the, the learning. It, it takes that implementation that gets you to the next step. Um, right. And now when you get this, this money, right, these are flipping. So you got to get to the next deal. You got to do this because you got to, you got to put your money to work. Um, I know you love cash flowing assets, but flipping isn't a cash flowing asset. It's, it's yep. in fact, kind of the opposite. You get the money and now you have to put it to work. How did you yep. handle scaling up this business? You did your first couple, but now, you know, you've, you flipped over a hundred houses. How did you scale it? Yeah, so I was for the first like for three, four years, um, it was just me. Like it was me. I did the phone calls, the marketing, the the project management, the money man. Like I did everything. And a mentor of mine all kept telling me like hire, 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 hire. And in my mind, I was like, I can't afford to pay somebody thirty five grand a year. Like no. So I just kept you know beating my head trying to figure it out. And like I made money. You know, I made a few hundred grand a year with myself. Um, and it was, everything was like, good, right. I was crushing it. I was 23, 24 making, you know, a quarter million dollars, but like, again, that's not the end goal. Right. So the, what, what, like what took me from that to where I am now was actually hiring a team and outsourcing. So my first hire was an assistant. Uh, my business like doubled in the first year. I was like, man, this works I'm working <laughs> less. I'm making more money. Like this is, this is perfect. 
Uh, and then I just started outsourcing. So I hired a project manager, I hired a sales team, I hired a dispositions team, I hired a transaction coordinator, um, I hired a property management company. So like I just outsourced because at the end of the day, each individual has a cap to their income, you know, different caps, right? You know, my cap may be a hundred grand per year, your cap may be 500 grand per year, but you are capped out at a certain level. And there's no way you can get past that level except for two things, leveraging other people's money and leveraging other people's times. That's the only way that you grow past that cap of yours. The richest people in the world, they have a lot of people around them and a lot of money that's working for them and leveraging other people's money. So uh, for me, I was already leveraging other people's money to do deals. But then when I started leveraging other people's time, hiring people, building a good team, that's when my business started to take off. Any any tips? Because I know you were building this from the ground up and you know, you were, you're so tied into the, this business. That's partially probably why you didn't want to outsource because you're like three, four years, you know, this is my baby. I don't want to give yep. this to somebody else and they're going to screw it up. Like, I don't, you know, I'm Austin, you know, I can, I, I do this. <laughs> this is my shit. Like, how did you eventually find that person where you're like, I can trust this person? How did you go about finding somebody to add to your team who you could then trust and then know that they can deliver? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not perfect, first and foremost, but like it's trial and error, you know what I mean? My first assistant quit in like 90 days or something. Um, and then I hired another one and then that person, that assistant was with me for like three or four years. And then my sales team was good for a year or two and then they parted ways. Project manager was terrible, they parted ways. So, you know, again, I have a good team now, but it's something that you just kind of have to go through. It's again, thinking like you start a business and you get rich overnight. It's like thinking you can hire one person in your business 10 times with zero headaches. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, do your due diligence on the front end, do the interviews, do the reference checks, you know, make sure that they can actually do what they say they're going to going to do email spreadsheets, whatever it is, um, then you just got to give it a try. So I always do a, um, a 90 day probationary period to make sure that they can prove that they can actually do what they were hired for. Um, and then, you know, they come on, you know, full time, but uh, the probationary period is huge because uh, I've had to let multiple people go during that time because they just, they just weren't producing at the end of the day. So you, you almost do a probationary, uh, any reason for that word? I, I guess I've never really heard that term. Um, that's just what I've always taught. It was told. Uh, right, beautiful. I, I I'm going to go with it. I'm going <laughs> to ride like, with it. It's like a test period, basically. I I'm, I'm sold. I'm sold. Um, <laughs> So, so, so we're talking about, you know, getting into it and then creating this entity, right? Um, so that's like the, the foundation. So, you know, how you started now into like the nitty gritty of real estate, right? I know so many people are curious in terms of, you know, taking out a loan, all these different strategies. And one strategy that uh, comes to mind, it's actually the, the TikTok video I stitched of you is the Burr method. Uh, could you elaborate on what exactly the Burr method is and the pros and cons associated with it? I saw you stitch it. I was like, that was smooth. <laughs> um, but yeah, like in theory, I always say that the basis behind it is getting a house for free. I know that sounds crazy, but I've been able to build a, almost a $10 million rental portfolio with 70 rental properties with basically none of my own money, which again, sounds crazy, but it's possible. So BRRRR stands for B-R-R-R-R. -R -R -R. A lot of people think it's like BRRRR, duh, B-I-R-D. It's not that. It's BRRRR, B-R-R-R-R. -R -R -R. So B is buy and then renovate and then rent then refinance, then repeat. So what that process looks like, round numbers, let's say a house, once it's fully fixed up is worth 200 grand. So when, you, when you're fully renovated and you rent it out, you take it to a bank to refinance it and it appraises at 200 grand. They'll give you like a 75% loan to value. So they'll lend you $150,000 on that property on a 30 year mortgage where you pay them, call it $1,500 a month in, in mortgage payments. So the goal behind it is to get all into the property for less than $150,000. So what that looks like is, let's say you buy this property for 100 grand and it needs $35,000 of rehab. So it's $135,000 into this property all in. So you borrow that money from somebody else, they lend the purchase and the rehab costs to you. You'll pay them interest, that's why they lend the money to you. Uh, but they fund the entire deal, you buy it, you renovate it. Let's say you rent it out for $2,000 a month to a tenant. Then you take it to a bank and refinance it. The bank gives you a loan of 150 grand. And remember, you owe 135,000 plus interest, let's call it 10 grand. So 145,000 plus closing costs, let's call it five grand. So you owe 150 grand and the bank refinances you at 150 grand. So you pay all your debt off. You don't owe anybody anything. And now you own this property with none of your own money. You're paying $1,500 a month in mortgage and you're renting it out for $2,000 a month. So you get a free house 
and you get the cash flow, appreciation, depreciation, and mortgage buy down, again, with none of your own money. So that's how I've been able to build my entire rental portfolio. It really is a beautiful strategy. And a, just, a, I guess, a couple of things to touch on, right? So the, like the reason why you want to rent it out is to get this cash flow. And then the renovate is to uh, you know, increase the value of the home. Yep. So then that way, if it was worth $100,000, a lot of times, if you put in a a thousand dollars worth of money in the right spots, you will make back more in the appreciated value. So it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. So that might be where somebody gets a little bit confused. You know, if you if you physically add value, you're also adding sweat, a sweat equity to it. But if you're physically throwing in, that. what was that? Yeah, I said if you do that, I, I don't do any work. <laughs> yeah. like, somebody's like somebody's <laughs> adding the sweat equity. For sure, for sure. But like to put it to example uh, into perspective, like I bought a house for ten grand. And then I put $110,000 into the rehab of it. And then it appraised for 220. dollars So the bank lent me about $140,000, $150,000. And I was all in for one hundred and thirty-five. dollars So the bank actually paid me $15,000 on the refinance. My mortgage was a grand a month. And I was renting each side for a grand a month. So the bank paid me fifteen dollars to own the property. I made $1,000 a month for three years in positive cash flow, and then I just sold the property a couple weeks ago for $375,000, and I owed one hundred and forty. dollars So not only did I get paid fifteen grand, I made $1,000 a month, and three years later, I walked away with a $200,000 check. Like, that's the power of real estate. You know, you get paid in multiple different ways, and you don't even need to use any of your own money. It's a beautiful thing. Um, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm in the real estate game as well, so I, I love hearing these here in these things. Now, for anybody who's trying to look to do this strategy, um, for example, uh, myself, right, I'm from New York, uh, currently in Long Island, finding a home that's worth $10,000 is easier said than done. Um, yeah. Any tips on finding these properties that are potentially burr opportunities? Yeah, so um, I've, I've bought deals off the MLS. I bought deals from other wholesalers and I bought deals from marketing on my own. So MLS is super easy. You just look on the market and buy something. Usually they're overpriced though. Um, secondly, you can buy from a wholesaler. So that's another investor that's wholesaling you the property. They'll make a little bit of money, but they're still giving you a good opportunity. I bought a lot of deals like that, um, that have fit that 75% um, value thing that I talked about. You wanna be all in for less than 75%. Um, and thirdly is marketing yourself. So a great way to do this is called driving for dollars. So you can drive the neighborhood uh, of whatever home value you think works and just drive that neighborhood and write down addresses of all the houses that are like messed up or need work. And then you take those addresses, you skip trace them, uh, which basically you put the name and the address, the, the, the homeowner name and the address of the property into a website. And then it gives you their phone number. And then you pick up the phone and you're like, hey, Bob, you know, I'll just reach out, see if you wanted to sell your property at 123 East Main Street. And you, you're going to get cussed out sometimes. You're going to get hung up on sometimes, but you're going to eventually connect to somebody. It's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd be interested. And now you just talk about the property, the condition, you run your numbers, you make an offer, and you see if it works. So uh, driving for dollars, skip tracing, and then cold calling is a great way to get into the game. Driving for dollars, that's what, okay, so you drive, you get the address, you then yep. get their information, you start cold calling, and then you, yep. you figure out a deal for whoever's receptive of this actual deal. Yep, correct. I might have to do that tomorrow. I, I, I might get, <laughs> I, I might come to Fort Lauderdale and hop in your car. We're we're about to start looking for some houses in Fort Lauderdale. Let, let's get it. Let's get it. Um, <laughs> but not, like on, on my on my YouTube channel, there's a video called Burr B R R R. It breaks down numbers and everything. And then there's a video that's called How to Make Twenty K in a Week, and it breaks down the driving for dollars process. So uh, you want watch both of those? Like literally, it's a step by step for you. And. I, I echo that. I, I've watched a couple of Austin's YouTube videos. I've commented on a couple and they're, they're super, it, you don't, you know, you don't need to pay for courses. There's information out there from people that have done it who are more experienced than, you know, your average person. So go, you know, watch his videos. And I, I've learned, I'm in the real estate. I have four units and I, I'm learning in this interview. I, I don't even know half these things. So um, <laughs> go, go check that out now. Um, one thing that you know we're, we're talking about the value of a cash flowing asset now this is something that i talk about a lot of time you, you know um some assets in crypto are potentially better than others because you can actually generate yield off them why is having a cash flowing asset so important versus something that just appreciates in value 
No, no, hundred percent. So ca cash flow is king, right? When markets tank, when when prices go down, when everything's lighting on fire, if you have money coming in that covers your living expenses or covers the debt on that property, like you literally have nothing to worry about. It doesn't matter if the property's worth a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. If you have enough money coming in to cover your mortgage payment, why does it matter? So, you know, cash, people always say cash is king and cash is powerful, but cash flow is truly king because that's how you stay afloat in down times. You know, most people, if you ask any business owner why they went bankrupt, it's because cash flow issues. They didn't have enough cash flow to cover their debts. Uh, so you always start with cash flow and real estate is a tremendous place to get cash flow. And I mean, you're, you're more in crypto than I am and I'm more in real estate than you are, but I feel like we're like trying to cross over. Like I love crypto because it's, it's an asset that appreciates and you can stake and get interest on. In real estate, again, it appreciates, you can get cash flow, but there's more headaches. You have vacancies, you have repairs, you have tenant turnovers, you have government eviction moratoriums. Mm -hmm. Again, great asset, but there's like a lot more variables at play. So my, my answer is not one or the other, it's how do you do both of them, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so this cash flowing asset, it allows you to be resilient through these, these harder times because you have a baseline and you don't have to, um, you don't have to liquidate these assets because you have the cash flowing coming in. You can cover your baseline so that way you can handle the depreciation. A lot of the times for people, specifically in real estate, when they sell is the worst time to sell. You know, they're not selling in a booming market a lot of the time. They're selling when it's the absolute worst. So yep. it compounds your losses in effect. So if you can have this cash flow to cover your basis, then you're, you know, you're feeling good. You're looking good. Um, yep. And now you mentioned it, crypto. Um, what interested you because real estate you know i talk about this a little bit like when you have real estate it's it's truly a, a physical thing i i don't think there's really a more simple asset class in the world it, everybody yep. lives in a house you know the value what got yep. you into crypto absolutely so COVID hit and i i was i had multiple streams of income but all in real estate i was flipping i was wholesaling i owned rental properties and i owned airbnb so i had four streams of income inside of real estate but that happened and for like 30 days everything froze like completely froze and i was sitting there like man like i need to have other money coming in like if real estate goes sideways like i'm screwed right so I started diversifying a little bit, you know, got into a couple other businesses. And then I, I bought the first time I bought Bitcoin was in 2017 at the peak of the crash. And then it, I put like a grand in and then it tanked. I had like two hundred dollars. I was like, well, fuck this. I'm out <laughs> and never thought about it for like three and a half years. And then my boy in November was like, bro, I, I got I got that thing. I was like, what's the thing? He's like, let me do some research. But I got the thing. So a couple weeks later, he's like, all right, bro, it's Bitcoin. And we, I heard briefly, briefly heard about it. And we had a very, you know, low, like a basic conversation on it. And I was like, let me, let me go, you know, figure out what this is all about. So I jumped on YouTube. I was like, Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I watched the video and it was an interview of somebody's interview. I forget what it is, but he compared it to gold. Gold is the most uh, finite uh, asset in the world. That's why it's valuable because we don't know how much gold is actually out there. The only thing that's more rare than gold is Bitcoin. The only thing. And I was like, wait a minute, like, if that's really true, there's got to be something here. So yeah, that's a catch. Up, oh, wait, hold up. <laughs> yeah. So I literally stayed up for like eight hours just watching YouTube videos on, on crypto and Bitcoin. And uh, it finally just sank in. I was like, this is it. Like, this, this is it. This is that thing. And uh, so I started buying into crypto. Like, I bought Bitcoin at seven grand, Ethereum at 300, Cardano at four cents, VeChain at two, at two cents. You know, I didn't go all in at the time. I wish I did. Um, but I started buying it. You know, I started I started working that muscle, you know, 2,500, five grand, five grand, 10 grand, five grand, five grand, started building it up. And I started learning more and more about it. You know, met mentors in the space, met people that have nine figure bank accounts in crypto. And they kept telling me about it. I was like, this this is really it. And, uh, you know, I put I put a few seven figures into it now and I'm, I'm balls deep in it. Um, so I, I believe it is the future. Um, you know, all this up and down right now, five, 10 years from now, isn't going to matter. What's it going to do tomorrow? I have no fucking clue. Right. Do I care? No, because I'm looking five to 10 years down the road. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm a full-time believer in it. And then my buddy that was in real estate, we was talking, I know he was in crypto. I was like, yo, tell me what you got going on. I'm trying to learn. And he put over a million dollars into Cardano at 14 cents. So motherfuckers making out right now. And he, he would put me on, he was like, bro, I'm on my crypto cash flow game. I sold all my real estate and I'm on crypto cash flow. I was like, the fuck is that? And then he broke it down to me that you can stake and earn interest just like real estate. And I was like, oh yeah, this this is it. 
And uh, like I said, I'm, I'm all in on it right now. I, I love it. The crypto cash flow. And it, it is awesome. Um, from my end, like, you know, because as you mentioned, I'm, I'm more in crypto. I'm also in real estate. Um, but yep. those are where my two biggest holdings. And why are my why is my money in those two spots? Um, real estate, because it truly is the most physical. I think it's the most simple at the end of the day asset class in the world. Everyone understands yep. it. Um, so that's one side of the spectrum. Then the other side of the spectrum, we have the entirely digital disruptive technology that we have no idea what it's going to look like in five years. And yep. from like a risk management perspective, you have where you're living, you have this cash flow, and at the end of the day, real estate's stable. Then you yep. have crypto. So, you know, I like balls to the wall. Like, let's <laughs> let's ride it. Let's get the real estate. Let's get the crypto. None of this funny business in the middle. Yep. And one hundred percent. And now you I, can I think... you can leverage it for this crypto cash flow. Um, and what we've seen is some turbulence in this market. You know, this is this is the crypto market every other day. But unfortunately, it's been a little bit like this. Um, yep, yep. What we've seen since the COVID, um, since the pandemic started, um, we're seeing, you know, this max exodus out of cities into, you know, suburban areas, which has driven up this real estate price across the country. Um, yep. And the birdies, everyone keeps chirping that, you know, we're in for a major market correction specifically in real estate. What are your thoughts about that? Oh man, great question. So I, I, thought, I thought a crash was already gonna happen, but the problem is when the government continues to print ungodly amounts of money, they just continuously kick the can down the line. So, you know, there was a, the eviction moratorium was supposed to be up today. They already postponed it to a few more months. So like, I got a buddy, he owns a 40 unit apartment building and all 40 tenants got together and stopped paying rent, all 40 of them. So he's got a $50,000 a month nut that he's got to take. And like, he has zero income on that. You know, I, I don't know if he's still afloat because I like, guess a year and a half, like that's a lot of money. You know what I mean? And if he's doing that, he's an educated investor. Think about like all the mom and pops out there that are going through these issues that depend on this income for the mortgage and for retirement. Um, I think there's personally, I think there's a whirlwind coming. Um, I, again, if they keep printing money, like I don't, I don't know when it's going to happen, but uh, I, I feel like there has to be something. Um, I don't think it's going to be like a massive correction, a massive crash. Um, I do think there will be a dip. Um, I don't know how big, but something has to come, you know, especially the second they increase interest rates, the affordability of properties, how much an individual can afford of a, a value of a home decreases massively every every point the interest goes up. Um, so I, I think like the first time home buyer market, you know, the, the entry level uh, will always be OK, because even the bigger guys will come down to that. Um, I think the the higher end stuff is going to get hit first because those people are going to you know not be able to afford it. Um, there's nobody like coming down into that section. Uh, so yeah, I think something's coming. When I don't know. A lot of it depends on what the government does. Right. Yeah. And yeah, to your point about these interest rates, um, you know why that one point on an interest rate makes it slightly less affordable because if you're buying a home, your mortgage payment then suddenly becomes more. So it's it's not necessarily about the value of the home that you close on. Instead, it's the 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 monthly cost of the actual loan itself. So the mortgage yeah. itself. So if you have an in increase in whatever a percentage point, whatever it may be, now all of a sudden you can't afford that three hundred thousand dollar home. You can only afford a two hundred thousand dollar home because the money, the the cost to borrow costs a little bit more. Um, and yeah. now on this inflation thing, this is something that I'm going on back and forth, yeah. right? I just bought a yeah. place in Delray, and now me and my partners were looking at buying a place in Miami. Um, both mm -hmm. markets have been dominating, fire. absolutely yeah. on fire. Um, but in the back of my mind, you know, I'm just thinking, what is getting affected by inflation first? Like, where are we seeing that money go? You made an interesting video on this and you equated it to buying a car. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, you have $10,000, a car is worth $10,000. Everybody gets $3,000 more. Somebody's going to want to put Thirteen thousand dollars on the hat on the car now because there's more money in circulation, um, yep. and what's just going on in my head is like, you know, we're comparing this market price to what we saw before COVID, and that's like the relation that we're seeing. But if we're seeing, you know, twenty two percent of the dollars printed this past year in circulation, like we're in a new market here. I, you know, I, I, we're in a different paradigm, and it's so hard because you don't have a crystal ball, but we've never seen this before we this amount of money exactly. printing i agree it's so the the we've all seen it crypto real estate and stocks have been through the roof like astronomically high 
And you got to understand when money gets printed in a mouse like that, eventually it goes to one type of person, which is the wealthy. The money always flows back to the wealthy because they're the ones that know how to make money. So inevitably it'll go back to the wealthy and the wealthy will invest their money into assets, which is crypto stocks and real estate. Um, so it's, it's this balance. We have this crazy inflation going up, which means assets go up in value. But then we have these interest rates that are like, nobody knows what the fuck's about to happen with the interest rates. So we have this thing like fighting each other. I, I don't know how this ends well outside <laughs> of con continuing to print a ton of money, which that in and of itself is a problem. Um, I, I, I don't know how we get over this again. I think it just keeps getting kicked down the road. Um, but like, again, going back to the point of crypto, like crypto was made to get rid of the government, not, not the government, but like a lot of things that happen with banks and the government and people, I don't think people really realize like what, where we're headed, but that's why I believe in it so heavily because I think it'll radically change the way the world operates. Um, so for sure. I'm here for, it. again, for I, sure. I don't know and, what that looks like, but something's and, happening. And I, I, to the point about crypto, you know, these, these government entities right now, they're running a, unchecked and they're in a difficult spot because, right, there's two scenarios. One scenario where they continue to print money and, you know, asset classes, they get inflated, but people are able to live their day-to-day -day lives. So, yeah. or they stop this and now people, they can't put food on the table and they can't live. And now, you know, there's, there's unrest across the entire country. It's a, it's a very difficult decision and you know there isn't a right answer um and frankly if i was in power you probably kick it down the road just because for one that's kind you of how politics back. work you know it's not your problem <laughs> because you just yep. you kick it down the road but what crypto provides and it's it's funny um i did a youtube video on this yesterday but it was basically what is bitcoin and we were discussing the origin of bitcoin and whether or not this was um, designed by Satoshi Nakamoto or not, um, Bitcoin was released at the end of 2008 to, and start of 2009, which happened to be when the United States real estate market crashed be, due to the banks, basically banks and government going unchecked. Now, yep. whether or not that was the motive, um, you saw that that was when it came into, uh, when it came, Bitcoin pretty much was launched. And then we see this past halving um, where in the actual uh, block, there was a message that was like the London government prints $2 trillion. So this was written in the code. I'll send you this link. It's crazy. It is crazy. So this is written in the code base um, by Satoshi before it was even released. And they were aware of the government's overreaching and an unchecked government is can will lead to the demise of its people and like the fact that they had this you know intuition and this i say they because nobody knows who created bitcoin um satoshi nakamoto is a pseudo name um but the fact that they knew like governments because there's nobody checking them like i have a theory that the united states should just continue to print more money and buy all of the bitcoin and that's that <laughs> it, yeah. it'd be genius like <laughs> No, for real. I mean, what if like the banks made the shit or something? I, I don't know. That shit's Dude, wild. Maybe. Like I can get into, I, so imagine, you know, what's interesting. So like China um, banning Bitcoin, I think we're going to look back on this um, from like the entire world. And this is, this is a very poor decision by China. I mean, it, it, it goes in line with their, you know, there's a reason why they don't want Bitcoin. Um, yeah. But imagine five, 10 years down the line, Satoshi's coins move. And then we find out that like the China, uh, like China created it or the United States created it. And now there's this entire global economy that's driven on this Bitcoin and the creators who now is a government entity own X amount of Bitcoin. It, that yep. is a movie that needs to happen. <laughs> Facts. For real, that, that'd be wild for sure. Yeah. Any, uh, any other conspiracies now? Um, what, um, so you're in, you mentioned Cardano. Um, what, uh, what other assets are you, are you interested in the crypto crypto sphere? Yeah. So as far as like another reason why I like Bitcoin too, when I heard that there's not enough Bitcoins for every millionaire in the world to own one, I was like, this is like, this is as scarce as scarce gets. 
so that's why I like Bitcoin. So I own Bitcoin. Again, not financial advice. Do your own due diligence, et cetera, et cetera. But I own Bitcoin. Um, I own Cardano. I own uh, Theta, T Fuel, uh, V Chain, Digibyte, and Hex. Um, so I'm I'm very very heavy in all those. Um, so hopefully they all pop. But you only, really only need one at the end of the day. But that's that's where my holdings are. Whenever I hear Theta, I just I think of us in the um, in the hotel lobby <laughs> and just Theta, like the video yeah. we made. It. Theta. Yeah. <laughs> right. He, he, like I don't know. This word like it's going to nine thousand dollars. Like no idea if that happens, but if it does, like that's what I'm saying. Like you, the thing, the cool thing with crypto, like the the in real estate, right? We get excited for a ten or twenty percent return percent. In crypto, people don't even blink an eye at a two to five x. Keep them asleep at a two to per, five x. <laughs> yeah. So we're excited for twenty percent. They don't even blink at two hundred to five hundred percent. So like that's the power of what crypto can do. And like at the end of the day, like you only need one of these to pop. You know, only one. So uh, yeah, that, that, I believe in it. <laughs> right. So you you know you you have your portfolio. You you work backwards from now. Do you run at any Airbnbs? Yes, uh, we have two, and we're transitioning like seven or eight more uh, to Airbnbs. From a traditional rental property to an Airbnb model? Yep, yep. Yeah, I, I've noticed the Airbnb model. Um, this is not an Airbnb plug. However, I have noticed that um, just from a profit standpoint, it is obviously more work. But if you can have the right pieces in place, you know, you can really get some cash flow. No, I agree. Um, a lot more moving pieces, different types of headaches, but with the right team, I mean, you can double or triple your income on the same property. Mm -hmm. That actually brings up a, um, a one question that I did want to ask that we didn't get to in the real estate portion, but can you explain, you know, people describe real estate as a passive income source. Can you dispel this rumor? Yeah. So, um, Real estate is not passive. It can be to an extent, but it's not 100% passive. Um, so like when you own a rental property, right? If you're managing it yourself, it's definitely not passive. Like I used to manage mine and I literally got a call during Super Bowl Sunday that the furnace went out and in Ohio, it's freezing. So I had to drive down there and fix the furnace in the middle of the Super Bowl game. And I was like, no, nope. the next week I hired a property management company. So like, if you're the one taking phone calls and leasing properties and doing maintenance calls, it's not passive at all. Um, now, if you have a property management company, it, it's more passive. But again, it's still not passive. Like I get calls from my management company when tenants move out and they say like, you know, hey, here's some pictures. It's destroyed. Do you want us to do this or this or this or this? And then right there, I'm back in the game. Or they can't lease the property. They're calling me like, hey, man, I know you wanted 1400 but we got to drop it to twelve or 1300 um, and then, you know, every month I got to check the books when the money comes in. And if there's something missing, I'm calling like, Hey, what's going on here? Oh yeah. It's been vacant for 45 days. So that there's still some management in it that if you're managing it, it's not passive in any way, shape or form. If you have a management company managing it, and then all you're doing is managing the management company, it's a little more passive. It, it's pretty passive at that point, but it's not fully passive at all. Yeah. It's not a set it come back 30 years later and you got a, a property getting those calls yeah. at the middle of the night. I'm sure, you, you know, you sleep with one eye open because you're just like, I'm ready for the furnace, for the door, for the, you know, the yeah. thermometer, whatever the hell it is. Thermostat, it's thermometer. Not. Honestly, they might be calling you about the thermometer as well. <laughs> for real. And then like you get, you throw Airbnb in the mix. Now you got neighbors bitching. Now you got parties. Now you got police. Now you got Airbnb calling you at 2 AM to shut down a house party. You know, there's again more management, but it's way more profitable as well. For sure, for sure. Now, um, what are the July Fourth plans? You you end up hitting up Heather for the for the yacht? No, so we we're going to rent. I ended up hitting people up for a yacht, but there's no yachts going out of Fort Lauderdale. All of them are booked. There's only ones in Miami, and I didn't I don't want to go down to Miami. It's like an hour and a half drive with traffic. Like it, it's a hike. Yeah, for sure. Is, did did are you sure there's no yachts in Fort Lauderdale? Heather might be able to plug it up. I, I hit her up. Oh, she there was, there was no like there was like one, but I, I don't know. It just didn't pan out. I hate to see it. Well, <laughs> so so you you had your date night. Any any other plans for the second half of the night? You making a YouTube's? Any content? Uh, I'm about to make some more content. Some news just dropped on some things, so about to make a few more TikTok videos. And uh, yeah, that's that's really it. The, the the grind doesn't stop. The content grind doesn't stop. 
Um, and if, you know, if you've listened to this whole interview, then, you know, you're aware that Austin is, wasn't, didn't walk into this situation. This, this is a, a result of hard work. This is a result of putting yourself in a position uh, t where you can get lucky, where you can get an opportunity, when you can take advantage of the opportunity. And, you know, I've learned a bunch here today. Uh, Austin's one of one of the the first people that I've actually interviewed that I've gotten the chance to you know get drunk with, have a good time. Uh, we didn't get to <laughs> the story enough. about how you had to call uh, your mom at the the bar in Miami. Thanks. <laughs> we can we can get to that another time. We can get to that at another time. Bro, um, I forgot about that. That's you forgot about know. that. Yeah, <laughs> dude, that was legendary. For, for okay, I, I have to now that I'm teasing it. So basically, um, we are we are in Bitcoin of Miami, and this was one of the nights, Saturday night or something, and we are we are getting drunk. You know, a couple cocktails. Uh, you know, Jack and Coke for Austin. I'm having a couple tequila shots, maybe one too many. And we start talking about everybody's origin and are like, where you know your nationality. So I'm German, Irish, Italian. And you know, we go to Mac Lord, and my my buddy, he's like, oh, I'm I'm Irish. And then we're like, Austin, what about you? And he's like, I don't know. We're like, what do you mean you don't know? And we don't really know Austin that, you know, that well. So we're like, okay, whatever. Um, we're not sure. But Austin's like, let me call my mom up. He calls his mom up in the middle of the bar. And she answers in like five seconds. And then what, what does your mom say? I was like, hey, mom, like, what am I? She was like, what do you mean? I was like, what? I, what am I? She's like, you're white. I was like, no, like, what am I? And to be honest with you, I forget what she said. <laughs> <laughs> it was Irish and something. But you were you, you were was. Czech, maybe? I don't I don't know. But we were like, you uh, found out, and like we were just like, this is a moment. This is a moment that like <laughs> we met Austin a couple of days about now, but like, you know, if we weren't friends before this, we're officially friends. Whether you like it or not, yes, we were here yes. for this conversation. But um, <laughs> that was awesome. That I'm looking forward to, you know, heading down to Florida, seeing you. I mentioned, well, you know, one of my best friends growing up is moving down there, you know, looking to get a place in Miami. So, you know, this isn't the last you've seen of this dumbass pink beanie. So I appreciate you for hopping on here. Um, and for everybody who's listening, thank you for, you know, being live in the chat. I, I've seen seen the, the messages. Um, they're, they're appreciative. They're saying, you know, your inspiration is inspirational. So thank you for hopping on. Um, everybody who's on this, I'm going to be hopping over to the incubator discord, which is linked in my TikTok bio. Um, and I'm just going to be chatting with whoever wants to talk about it, talk real estate, talk crypto. So I'm heading over to the incubator, link in my TikTok bio. Austin, anything you'd like to say? Uh, man, this was awesome. Um, greatly appreciate you having me on. Again, I, I watch all, all your videos. I'm sure, I'm new to crypto, right? You know, I, I know a decent amount of real estate still learning, but like crypto is new and like, I love this stuff. So keep keep putting out what you're putting out. Appreciate you, uh, you jumping on here, brother. And again, anybody who wants to learn more about real estate, I got videos on my YouTube channel, Austin Rutherford, uh, to learn Airbnb, raising money, flipping, managing contractors, anything you got to know. So definitely, definitely check that out. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. All right, brother. Go check out his YouTube. Come chat in the incubator discord and we'll talk soon. Appreciate right, it, brother. Man. Absolutely. Peace. Peace out.